Okay, today um, Earl Waugh is going to take you through a fascinating subject of uh, ethics after the robots take over. I sent you uh, references about the really spectacular advances that seem to be coming in quantum uh, computing. And it may seem to you like what Dr. Waugh is talking about, it's going to be a long time before these questions really come up, but it might not be. You, you, you might find that these questions are, are rising much sooner. I also wanted to mention over the weekend that I'm going to the Singularity Summit in uh, San Francisco, and I'm sure I'll, I'll come back with lots of new ideas about the course. It, it is uh, directly relevant, obviously, to what we do here. So any questions for me? If, if not, we'll pass the microphones on to Dr. Wong. Well, I'm happy to be here again. And it's a great privilege to talk to you about a subject that I think is really fascinating. It's also one that if you've done any surfing around on the web, you'll know that it's off the map. That is, there is more stuff out there than we can possibly cover in an hour and 50 minutes or however much time we've got here. So I hope you understand that what I have decided to do is to just to select a, um, a few comments from important movers and shakers in the field and, and to concentrate on those. Um, because it's uh, virtually impossible to cover everything in medical ethics that, that is going to arise with the uh, application of robots to medical science. Um, there are two ways, it seems to me, that, that robots can be applied in medical science. And the first one, of course, is an entirely supportive role. And that's the kind of role that most of the activities out there that you're going to see on the web deal with. In other words, they address issues related to that. But there is also another aspect of the potential of robots, and that is whether or not um, robots can supersede humans. In other words, uh, take the humans to another level and uh, create a new uh, kind of human. That kind of issue seems to be to be very speculative. And um, also, I have serious doubts about whether um, it can be applied in any sense that we can grasp at our current level. Whatever that might mean, I don't think we can grasp it at the moment. And so, um, as you'll see from my presentation, uh, there are all kinds of important aspects in medical science that can utilize robots and in fact some of them are under development as we speak. There are some aspects of this that immediately to me raise ethical issues and the first one I just picked up one off the web. The first one off the web is that Foxconn International, a, 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 an organization and a business that makes components for iPhones and iPads, etc. All of this stuff. They have decided that they will buy 1.2 million robots to replace workers. In effect, then, uh, what's happening in the robot era is that uh, humans are being eliminated as a potential area for work. And so, uh, one of the business decisions then is that they would, if they pay, let's say, a million dollars to to have these robots made, and these robots then can be programmed appropriately, it'll do without 1.2 million workers. I, if if I were the leaders in China, I'd be concerned about that, because I think what it basically means is that that uh, the human uh, capital that they have in China will be uh, will decline and the important uh, role that humans play in manufacturing will decay. We have seen that, of course, in North America. So the other thing that I picked up for is just quite interesting, I think, for uh, a stomach or gastric cancer. 
those of you who are uh, specializing in this area or are interested in um, stomach issues will know that uh, gastric cancer is a leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide. And for those of you who are in East Asia, you will know that there is an awful lot of gastric cancer in that part of the world. Well, uh, Singapore's National University, Ho and Phi, made a crab that enters through the mouth and can eat cancer in the stomach. So in effect, they were having lunch one day and, and they said, you know what? What if we could make a crab that could get down into your stomach? I, I tell you the truth. They said, and they had crab for lunch. And so in the, con in the conversation, they said, well, look, why don't we tra take the crab and use the crab idea to get at these cancers? So what we do, for example, we make a little crab with really good pinchers and, and then we put it into the stomach and we have a little video camera go with it and, and it can take the, the cancer and snip it off and then come back out again. And it is much less invasive than the kind of uh, surgery that we do now. So, in effect, um, this is what they have done. And so, uh, they have constructed this crab that will eat cancers. Now that's just one tiny example of the way in which robots could be useful in the future. There's one thing that's very important in that technology and that is it can, it can slice and do things in a much more steady way than the human hand. The problem with surgery, if you know surgeons well, they will tell you that especially when you're doing surgery in the brain and, and, and other critical parts like the heart, when you're doing this kind of surgery, a, a, a tiny slip of a millimillimeter will, could be the difference between that individual's life and death. So in effect, one of the problems with surgery, especially in brain and other places like that, is the human hand shakes. And especially when you're concentrating in surgery, the shaking does all kinds of things to what you can do and what you can accomplish. So, let's just take a kind of reprise of the whole area and just to give you some indication of the range and scope of, of the activity of a potential robot. Now, one of the things that, um, that robots can do, of course, they can be programmed to do chores that, that humans do all the time. The other aspect of the robot is that a robot can be programmed to do things that humans cannot do, in which case they may be controlled by the human, but they may not. So if we are, let's say, projecting into the future, and we're going to talk about a world in which the robots do everything, including you're going to have a robot wall stand up here and tell you, you know, um, all of these things. These things are going to change the way activities are undertaken. In fact, probably in the future, we won't even have a classroom. We'll have a virtual classroom. So one of the issues that you're going to find uh, if you look into this at, with any great depth is that one of the issues that we're dealing with is the blurring of the line between the human and the machine. So, uh, can we develop a machine that mimics the human to such an extent, and of course, Blade Runner and other kinds of movies uh, are, uh, trade on that idea. The other thing is that for, for this group that's here, you are a highly advanced group of humans. If you go out there, out beyond the walls of this institution, you'll find people who haven't a clue about what you're talking about. In fact, I, I dare say if you were to go home and talk to your parents about some of these things, they would, you know, their eyes would swim and they would just say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. So the, the fact of the matter is that technology is already beyond the intelligence 
of most humans. So if you put that together, it means then that uh, we have a technology already in place that is really beyond the ability of most of us to understand. And of course, people like me are well known to be Luddites when it comes to technology. And so, and I don't think I'm absolutely stupid. So in effect, then, this is already beyond what most people in the world can handle. Is it possible then that we can have a technological environment in which robots control all of the main dimensions of society? That is, they can control what it is you listen to, they can control what it is you learn, they can control what uh, kinds of activities you undertake, they would control exactly what you would do at any particular time of the day. And if you didn't do that, there would be checks and balances built into the system that um, would modify your behavior. So in effect, is there, a, is there a problem with this kind of thing? Well, um, the, the problem is one of control. If you develop a machine that can do everything that you want to do, everything that a human can do, what happens, how do you uh, um, address that control issue? For example, is that control going to be entirely logically framed? Is it always going to be logic so that if you tell it to do this, this time, it's always going to do that next time? And the bottom line is that we don't know. It's quite possible the way we program machines that they will do that. But we have no idea of what kinds of problems might develop in, in the application of that. Moreover, a human is an unknown uh, quantity sometimes. I mean, humans change their mind. So if you tell you know, a car to go straight and all of a sudden you decide that you want to turn that way, can the computer act quickly enough to do that. So in effect then, the notion of control is a, is a fuzzy one. Who controls it is a big issue. Now the other issue that you'll see on the web, is it really acceptable to replace humans when we come to um, uh, looking at many of the issues that we have to deal with from a medical perspective? That is, is it really acceptable to develop machines that can operate better than surgeons can? Is it really better for us to develop machines that can um, assist you to do something better than you can do it as a human? We already have these kinds of things. So the real issue is, is it, is it acceptable to replace your skills with something that will increase your abilities beyond what you have as, a, as a, a current human. Now, I think this is an ethical issue and is an issue that's worth debating. But we don't have time to examine all the ramifications of that, but if you look on the web, you'll find that kind of discussion. The other issue has to something to do with what I would call the psychology of humans. When I was a kid, my father told me yeah, I can fix your wagon. Yeah, I know the wheel is off your wagon. Yeah, I know you've got problems trying to figure out how to put it back on. But he says, I'll, I'll be darned if I'm going to do it for you. I'll be darned if I'm going to fix that wagon for you. I said, Dad, but why, why don't you just fix the wagon? You can do it in no time flat. He said, you're not going to learn anything if you rely on me, go fix your own wagon. Now what I did was, I took all the wheels off the wagon and I put them on a go-kart. So if my father had not said, go fix your own wagon, I would never have got to the point where I thought, what the heck, a wagon is kind of blah. If I build myself a really neat go-kart, I can run around in a go-kart rather than a wagon. It's a much, you know, that's, that's much more cool. We didn't use the word cool back there, but, <laughs> but that's the way it is, see? Now, I want you to think about that with regard to, to machines. 
If we're in a world in which robots basically do everything for us, what kind of initiative is that going to leave to us? And I think there's a psychological problem of dependency. And I think it's going to change the complexion of human activity and it's going to change initiative and it's going to change creativity. In my view, it's going to modify the parameters of what it is to be human in a, a very significant way. Well, the final issue out there that I can talk about is one of, of the robot. Yeah? Are we going to be able to build a robot that's sensitive to, to what humans want? Now, the easy answer is yes, we can do that. But the tough answer is sensitive to whom? Now, I can tell you that what's sensitive to Kim is not sensitive to Earl. And I think probably the next guy sitting to you, what is sensitive to him may not be sensitive to you. So, in effect, are we going to be able to build machines that are sensitive to the nuance of sensitivity? And you see, this develops all kinds of issues from a, a perspective of the robot. So, all of these issues, I think, have ethics buried in them. Ethics is part and parcel of it. So what I have done is frame this statement, okay? Even if a super robot were to control all medical systems in the future, with unlimited possibilities to manipulate the human, so long as the word human applies, there must be a presumption of ethical awareness, an available intentionality to express self meaningfully, and some sense of legitimate choice. In effect, the human ceases to exist when these values are removed or compromised beyond recognition. So long as the statement X is better for humans has relevance, then ethical evaluations will define the human. Even if we adopt Zaidi's argument for a fuzzy logic application, we just have no means of relating to beings that don't ex uh, exhibit these minimal elements. So in effect, I am saying that if you're going to talk about replacing the human you're going to have to deal with a very basic element of what constitutes human experience. The element of choice, the element of, of, of human awareness and sensitivity, and the element of, of human ethical thinking. We have no guarantee, of course, that, that we're going to be able to find that kind of thing in a machine, unless, of course, it is built in. So if we look at this whole area, just a couple of things to, to raise your discussion level. Ethical reason is a contested area in current human experience. And in just about any kind of medical procedure that you have, there is an ethical content. Now I was over in nephrology giving grand rounds the other day and um, I don't know if Kim has heard about the controversies that I stirred up, uh, but I was presenting on Aboriginal uh, understandings and Aboriginal perceptions of medicine and, and some of the controversies that have been in the past in medicine. And one of them I mentioned was the medic medicine box. Now, for those of you who don't know, much about treaties organization. In some of the treaties, there is a reference to the medicine box. And the medicine box basically says that in return for deeding over these lands, uh, you will take care of our medical uh, requirements. So the medicine box is the, is the language used back when the treaties were signed. So I stated that in the, in the meeting and one chap was sitting at the back and he waved his hands at me and he said, that's not true. 
He said, we don't owe the, the Aboriginal people anything. It's not in all the treaties. I said, you're right, it's only in one or two of them. But I said, from the standpoint of Aboriginal people, they believe that this is part and parcel of what we must pay in order to, to live in this country. So in effect, then, we have an ethical requirement to do this from an Aboriginal perspective. Whether you want to accept it medically or not, that's not for me to judge. But from an Aboriginal perspective, the ethics of this issue are that you're living here at their behest and, and approval based on the fact that you're going to provide all of the kind of medical uh, uh, help that they need. So, there was a huge kerfuffle about this. There was all kinds of, and in fact, he got up and walked out. It's quite extraordinary in this day and age in Canada that this should be an issue. It's just absolutely extraordinary. So I was, Tom, I was talking to Thomas Mueller after the class and he said, you know, I've seen the same kind of gut reaction to your lecture that I saw in Germany when somebody mentioned the Holocaust. Now for you young people here, you might find that just hard to believe. But the fact of the matter is that that's how visceral Canadians are when it comes to what it is that we have to pay for living in this country. Just about any aspect of medical procedure then has an ethical hook in it. How much will you pay? How many procedures will you allow? How much do you owe? Well, all of these things are full of, of what I call ethical reasonings. And I want you to multiply that by a world in which the robots are not central to everyone's life. Tim's been to Nepal. He knows very well that their level of medical understanding is way below where we are now. And there are pockets around the world of people who scarcely, you know, know what a scalpel is. So the issue that I present to you today and the challenge I see for you is how are you going to universally apply robot technology in a world of such diversity as we live in? It's a huge ethical issue. And so that's why I say the literature on all aspects of futurism bristles with ethical challenges. Because applying the notion of robots even in a very small area raises um, the issue of equality. So finally, the very definition of the human may be modified beyond what we really think humans are. Are you willing to accept that? Are you willing to accept that your child will not be human in the same way that you are? And are you willing to accept the fact that we could modify the situation in which some people in the world would be far more intelligent and have far more control over the robots than we do? I think these are ethical issues that we have to deal with. So here are some systemic issues and some ethical ramifications of them. I've looked at, at five, uh, four different um, thinkers who deal with the issue of ethics, and I've just brought uh, some of their statements here for you to mull over, okay? This is not in any way, shape, or form complete, but this will give you a taste of the issues that are out there. So, let's look then, first of all, at nanotechnology and the ethics of forecasting. So here's what Horner has to say. 
Nanomedicine devoted not merely to ameliorative medical treatment, but to the improvement of human performance. So in effect then, do we put our resources into making you better, or at least a select number of people better? Is that where nanomedicine should go? So that's the first primary issue that he is arguing. And then he says, a forecast may only be properly made if it's made on the basis of sufficient knowledge, experience, and evidence. Well, what's the hook there? The hook is that we don't know what that potential might be. At this point in time, all we can do is base our notion on causality as we've understood it. But we don't understand everything about what these machines will do if, in fact, we come to the point where we utilize nanomedicine widely. So if the outcomes are beyond our knowledge and control, then we can't be held responsible for them. So is it possible that we could construct a world in which we no longer have control over the ethical framework of that particular world? Yes, it is. According to the technology that we have in place now, we could do that. Well, here's the issue that you have to grapple with then, because a central plank of the moral, uh, of moral the uh, theory is except that moral agency and judgment must be immune to luck. In other words, this has to be something that comes out of the ethical procedure. Now, Horner's argument is, not that we give up, but that we develop a nanoethics. I.e., as you heard the other day, the problem of, of uh, nanotechnology is precisely that the causality and the, the dimensions of what we see in, in this, at this level of understanding does not apply at the nano level. So you have an entirely different kind of structure being developed at the nano level. So the issue for us is, can you develop a nanotechnology moral? Is there an ethical basis to this? Then let's uh, go to Kurzweil. Human life will be irreversibly transformed. Although neither utopian nor dystopian, this epic will transform the concepts, okay? That we rely on to give meaning to our lives from our business models to the cycle of life, including death itself. So from Kurzweil's perspective then, it is quite possible to transform human life and that machines, in fact, will do that. These, the arguments then, are based on what we can see as being part and parcel of our future. And of course, uh, uh, Kim has talked to you a great deal about singularity, and so this is a very famous statement of his, there'll be no distinction post-singularity between human and machine, or between the physical and virtual reality. And then finally, there are six historical epics that are driven in a law-like manner, the law of accelerating returns, by the exponential growth of information and technology. Erspile argues then that these are laws, but he uses laws in a fuzzy sense. Um, he thinks this law uh, uh, indicates an exponential growth of information and technology, and of course, as Kim has sent you, we have just seen a really good example of that in the um, possibility of a quantum computer. And then his final quote, a theory of technological evolution as justification for the shape of future society. So in effect then, what he argues is that in a course like this, we should be trying to chart where technology is going to take the human. And so my argument is that if that is the case, one of the things that we should be doing is trying to chart what happens to the moral, to moral theory and to ethical development in that kind of future. 
All right, let's go quickly then to William Joy. You know probably William Joy's book, and Not Welcome in the Future. A couple of quotes. Genetic engineering, robotics, and nanotechnology will extinguish human beings as we now know them. And then Joy's big fish eat little fish argument quotes robotics pioneer Hans Moravec. Biological species almost never survive encounters with superior competitors. Now that makes a rather grim reading. I mean, I, I, I sit here and read this and think, wow, what do these young minds think of this kind of approach? I mean, you're going to go out and, and, and have a second cup of coffee and you're going to sit down with your girlfriend and you're going to say, hmm, or your boyfriend. Um, you're going to sit down with them and say, you know, in the future, we're going to be different, entirely different than we are now. How do we grasp that kind of possibility? Not only that, but it will extinguish it. Will the extinguishing means that we get rid of our moral dimension, that we will get rid of the sense of what is better, what is best, what is right, what is wrong. Now, my argument going back to the beginning is that that's not where humans are going to go. So long as we have humans, we're going to have a moral and ethical dimension to where we go. So this is something that we can debate after, we're done, after I'm done. Here's another thing that might be well worth you thinking about. So self-application is the issue here. A bomb is blown up only once, but one bot can make Come many and quickly get out of control. So if you put in place a bot that can remanufacture itself over and over and over again without any kind of controls on that bot, then what have you put in place and who is going to control that? Now right now, humans have a certain sense of control and as you know, you control your notes, you control your exams, you control what you can do, you, all of those things are under your control. And one of the problems that people have when they are psychologically disturbed is that they can't grasp control. So in effect then, if, if this um, dimension of our experience is beyond our control, what is that going to do to the human and from Joy's perspective, it will eliminate the human. So all of these technologies, he says, is widely within the reach of individuals and small groups. So we have people who know how to do this. And so we have knowledge-enabled mass destruction. In effect, then, we could be on the cusp of what he calls extreme evil. So, one last point and we'll move on. This is the first moment in the history of our planet when any species by its voluntary actions has it become a danger to itself. So in effect, what we can do is to create a machine that will destroy us. Or it will destroy the environment in which we live to such an extent that we will be unable to handle it in the future. All right, let's look at uh, Richard Mason, right, on the ethical issues in AI. Some of these issues I talked about the last time I was here, but it, it might bear, uh, you know, rehearsing some of the things that Mason has to say. The fundamental assumption behind this is that every aspect of learning or any other form of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So in effect, from this perspective, it's, it's quite possible to replicate you. A machine, sometime in the future, we could, in fact, um, give it the same sensitivities that you have. So for him, this, this uh, poses a prime problem. 
for this means that you could in fact construct a machine that could take the evil parts of your perception and and focus upon those without the kind of balance that is built into the human perception and then approaches built on this perception are called symbolic or symbol processing okay so what he wants to argue then is that physically it would be silicon based rather than carbon based and we've already heard about that in this computer they'll be able to think and feel and have moods and be emotional and interact with society they'll they'll be able to draw on common sense and they will in effect have a soul or a personality so these will become according to mason then the next stage in evolution so humans will evolve to the next level or they will cease to exist the question of granting personhood to an AI machine or robot depends on what he thinks where the line is drawn between persons and inanimate objects so for him the overarching criteria is displaying some sort of cognitive capacity being conscious or having perceptions or feeling sensations now I think this raises some big big issues and all of these things we could debate for quite some time but here are some that he you know based on what Turing said she she predicted of course that within about 50 years time we'll be able to program computers to make them play the same kinds of games so that we wouldn't know the difference between humans and we've already seen that that's been achieved so we can hope that machines will eventually compete with men in all purely intellectual fields well here's something that I want you to think about AI programs form relationships with other entities they're used to advise humans etc etc their role in these relationships engenders moral moral responsibility so in effect from Mason's perspective the moral element will have to be built into the robot in the future that is we will not have a robot that is not morally sensitive in effect then whatever we construct from Mason's perspective has to be adjudicated by a moral sensitivity and building a robot then is not just a matter of putting a machine together that has no particular relevance to the moral environment from his perspective and I think it's a very interesting one if you're going to build a machine then moral you have to be morally responsible for programming that machine to have this kind of moral sensitivity otherwise within the environment of the human that machine will be a wild card from him uh, from his perspective that that will not be allowed okay so here's some bibliography for you and let me kind of wrap up what I'm going to say here and then we can have some discussion about these issues when we try to understand the relationship between humans and machines we basically see that that the machines that we've constructed to this point in history have have been what we would call aids or supportive of human activity and intuition and development the central feature for AI and for nanotechnology seems to me to be whether we will allow machines that will that will create things that are beyond our control and are not uh, foreseen by what we program into them so in effect then the issue of the robot in the future and and the ethical relationship we have with it 
from my perspective, can only be adjudicated by a human moral perspective. In other words, we cannot expect a machine to have an a ethical perspective like ours if we do not program that machine into having that kind of perspective. So my take on the robot of the future is that if it is in fact going to play a role in the development of human society, that that robot then will need to be programmed to be aware of and sensitive to the human perspectives of right and wrong and good and evil. That will change the notion of the machine. Because the machine up to now has been constructed to be entirely supportive of the intentions of the human. If we, if we develop a machine that is beyond that, then I think what we have to do is program that machine to have moral sensitivity. I cannot see how the future, regardless of what is uh, prophesied, I cannot see a future in which humans do not have a moral sensitivity built into what it means to be human. So even if we are talking about human in a superhuman sense, I still argue that in that superhuman sense there will be an ethical component. So if we're going to define humans at all then that issue is central. That's my point of view. Now this is not an exact science is it? <laughs> um, let me throw out some counter points. If we can develop a machine that can do all of these things, even though we don't understand what it's doing, should we do it? Now, there are some people who argue that, you know, we should go ahead and do that, you know, based on the atomic bomb theory. We didn't know what impact the atomic bomb would have, even though the Einstein had a pretty good idea what was going to happen. But we didn't know how extensive it would be and we didn't actually know, you know, whether it was going to blow the whole world up. I can remember I trained at the University of Chicago and you probably know that the first kind of atomic uh, uh, development that was made by Fermi at, in, uh, in Chicago and it was made under Stag Field bleachers and and the president of the university was pretty concerned because there was no guarantee that whatever this this uh, scientific experiment was going to do would be controlled at that time they had no idea of you know fission and how far it would go and what would be the impact and so uh, when they tried this thing under stag field there was all kinds of people in central administration holding their breath because they thought, my God, we could you know, wipe out Chicago and we won't know what will happen. Well, of course, it didn't. And so now we understood a little bit about the control mechanisms that were built in at the time. But the fact of the matter is that for people who are exploring these kinds of areas, there are a lot of unknowns. And there are a lot of areas that you are not really able to um, conceive of. So this is just one example of the fact that we have tried things that really go beyond our ability to know how we can do. So therefore, the counter argument to mine is we should do it anyway. There's another counter argument. Part of the way in which humans have always been is to try the untriable, to do the unimaginable, to explore, you know, uh, space and to explore all kinds of things, that this kind of creative energy is what has driven humans to their very best. So in effect, if you don't do this kind of thing, you're going to be limiting um, the, 
the power and the potential of what uh, current humans are able to do. So in effect then, um, we should be developing these machines even if we don't know their impact. And the argument is based then on creative imagination. And one last counter to my argument. The fact of the matter is that machines could make a more equitable universe, a more equitable world, and would free individuals from manual labor and all of these kinds of things so that we could be an entirely different kind of species in the future. So um, whether or not these machines have the kind of ethics built into them that, that I have argued that they should have is probably immaterial. That we should just do it and, and uh, see the potentials that are developed in human society. Well, I think there are all kinds of things that we can discuss here, and probably you're much more able to discuss these than I. So what I'm going to do now is to stop, and um, let's talk about these things. I think, I think this progress is inevitable, whether it'll happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, mm. it'll happen, whether it'll be with our generation or the generation after us. Is this a law? Is this Osmar's <laughs> law that we've got here? The, uh, <laughs> I, I think the wisest thing to do indeed is to teach these machines about ethics and they will be more ethical than mm. we are today ourselves. Uh, the interesting thing about ethics is that um, what I believe is right and wrong, somebody else in another country with another education, mm -hmm. another kind of culture, may not see as right or wrong. I mean, it, it's correct. not necessarily the same. Yeah. Even in our own society, with time, ethics change. So, not a very long time ago, uh, it was okay to kill somebody in a duel. If they throw the glove at you and there's a duel, it's okay, it was mm -hmm. legitimate. It's not acceptable today. Um, so we don't know what ethics will be tomorrow, what is right and what is wrong for tomorrow. So it's a very interesting but difficult question to answer. So in that context, when, when ethics may change as well, and we don't know what ethics will be tomorrow, how can we decide about uh, what we should do for tomorrow based on our vision of today? I don't think that ethics is rooted in um, cons uh, what I would call time-bound cons concepts. I, I think that ethics is an entirely different kind of, of awareness, of sensitivity, maybe even of rational thought. It is an entirely different kind of thinking. And um, I, think, I think it's probably almost unique, or at least it has a large part of being unique to humans. There may be animals that have similar kinds of awarenesses, um, and, and we do see some behavior among animals that seems to be, seems to have a kind of ethical awareness built into it. I mean, um, um, I mean, I'm searching in my head right now for an example of this, but what keeps coming up is the, the image of, of elephants returning to the funeral site of the old um, head of the, uh, of what do they call an elephant group? Pride or whatever. Anyway, whatever a group of elephants is. And I, and I can't help but think that this kind of sensitivity to the death of an individual within, among the elephants, has some kind of echo in human behavior too. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to limit 
this perception entirely to humans. And I'm not opposed to the notion that we could build ethical sensitivity into it. What you put your finger on for me is a real problem. And that is how you um, give a robot sufficient mental, med, um, uh, mental tools, right? To handle the, nu uh, the nuances that we build into our ethical reasoning. And so this, I think, is the real problem. I, I, I just don't think that there's a problem in, in um, what we would call rational decision making within a machine. I think what the real problem is, is evaluation and ethical norms of that evaluation. But, but even though we humans today have those tools, we still differ on many things. Yeah. Take the, take the yeah, sure. death penalty, for example. Yeah. Uh, we don't have the death penalty here. In the States they have it, in other countries they have it. But the way also uh, uh, of uh, killing is different. They behead yeah. people in Saudi Arabia, they inject a, a chemical in the States, they hang somebody else in somewhere else, they have the guillotine yeah. in France, they used to anyways. So, and, 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 uh, so beheading would be uh, uh, bad for us. We don't see, even if, suppose we are in the States, we accept death penalty, we would see that as something unethical to, uh, uh, well, to be had somebody with all the pain that we can imagine and all that stuff. Currently today in the, in the states, in the, some of the states where death penalty is, is still uh, done, we're trying to think about limiting the pain and all that stuff to make it acceptable. So if we provide, so despite the fact we have all these tools, we, we interpret things differently. So machines, when we give them these tools, will they also interpret uh, the right and wrong in different ways, or will they be cookie cutters? We don't expect them to be cookie cutters. Uh, they will be different. So well, well, yeah, that's a good point, Oswald. The, the argument that you get uh, on many of these, from many of these people is that, you know, if we can have them evaluate data and come out with an answer, that they they could be programmed to evaluate whether or not, you know, you're going to kill your daughter or not. You know, um, in other words, you, the issue is not just a matter of, of uh, building a machine that can make evaluations. It's also uh, weighing the potential outcomes and, and what I have called the moral thinking that goes into it. I, I think building into a machine not the specifics of the case you know not whether or not we're going to hang this guy or give him a shot it that's not the kind of thing that i i'm concerned about it is whether or not this machine will be able to distinguish right from wrong i.e is it a, is it acceptable that the machine kill me after i've created it so the the, the uh, i had a, this discussion uh not a long time ago with other colleagues about ethics and, and teaching ethics to machines and one was joking saying well why don't we create a new religion and make sure that all the machines are devout uh, followers of this religion mm -hmm. and the religion says that all humans are gods and the machines have to follow those gods mm -hmm. and if they don't obey there are consequences would that make more sense than just trying to teach them ethics because then we, we guarantee they will not harm us and we will always be superior. Well, I, uh, from my perspective, the issue of religion is somewhat different than moral reasoning, right? Yep. Um, I think religion brings another dimension into the issue. And, um, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want us to program a machine so that it would be pious when we're pious and not pious when we're not pious. I, I mean, I, I just, um, I, I find that completely opposite to what I understand people when they're religious, what they want to do. So in effect then, I think what I'm trying to argue for is that if we're going to have a machine that can evaluate, it should have a, an evaluation mechanism that would allow it to evaluate right and wrong, and whether or not any 
any given um, action on its part would, uh, would be judged as right or wrong. And if you cannot give a machine that kind of evaluation and nuance, then, then it can't be turned loose in a human society. That's, that's my point. So I don't have any problem in using uh, robots you know, to do surgery. I think that, that's just an extension of our capability of, of uh, control. But a machine that is that looks like you and walks like you and talks like you and then destroys everything in this room is not my idea of, of what we should create. So um, perhaps that's old school, I don't know, but that's, I think that's uh, my line in the sand. So, Oh, here comes the heavy artillery, guys. Look out. Can I come down here? Uh, can I come down here so that I... Because I feel absolutely isolated back here. Yeah. We, we just need to re, readjust a little bit for okay. your so, deployment closer to us here. Yes, right. <laughs> well, I, I just feel much... No, I don't know, back there you feel somewhat separated from the reality of the world. There's a very heavily um, watched Ray Kurzweil uh, YouTube video from 2006 where, where he talks about advancing technology and Moore's Law. I think several million people have, have watched this particular video. One, one of the very striking things about the argument that he makes is how chaotic the world is that is making that straight line of Moore's Law. You have companies that are going bankrupt mm -hmm. and companies that are being taken over by other companies and companies founded with really stupid ideas that are going nowhere, and others founded with absolutely brilliant I ideas. And th there's tremendous chaos, and yet you end up with this straight line, you know, exponential Moore's Law, mm -hmm. that's actually reflecting the average that comes out of all that chaos. Mm -hmm. Now that, that's fine from the Moore's Law point of view. Let, let's think about you know, the, the ethical side of things, the friendliness, unfriendliness, good and bad. It, one of the fascinating things in the talk that Marcus Hutter will, will give next Tuesday, he's, he's talking about uh, optimizing uh, you know, computer systems and the tremendous difference that something that's a little bit better could have. You know, you, you have one system that's pretty good and another that's just a little tiny bit better, but it, that little tiny bit better could basically win the day. Wouldn't it be a wonderful world if it turns out that being friendly to humans is just a little bit better for a computer than not being friendly, and being morally good is just a little bit better than being not more morally good. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think from the, in some basic sense, from the point of view of the computer, those things are never going to matter, or do you think that maybe if you just put logic in a computer, that being friendly is more logical, maybe only a little teeny weeny bit, but just slightly more logical than being unfriendly. And being good is just, you know, slightly enough better for, for the computer that we, we may end up in a world that's less challenging than we think if the natural order of the background chaos is such that it's slightly better for the computer to be friendly to us and to do mm -hmm. things that are morally good. Do you think that, that's, yeah. that's possible? Oh, wow. Um, there are so many issues involved in this, aren't there, huh? <laughs> yes. For example, when we say better, 
that already implies to me a kind of a human standard of what it is, right? And yeah. and even when we talk, when you talk about friendly, you know, yeah. what what does friendly mean? I mean, if you walk down the street and you and there's a woman walking down the street and you say, "How are you?" You know, she's going to think you're nuts yeah. and probably call the cops or something, right? Yeah. So. The issue is, what does friendly mean, and can we program in to a, com a computer all of the, the, the nuances of, of how uh, we understand the human experience to be? I, I don't think so. I just think that even if we could give it all the options that we could think of at the moment, there would be other um, situations where uh, the human mind has to make leaps and jumps, and right. I don't think it's possible to, to do that kind of thing. I you, doubt that. You talked about control, and one can imagine that in the same sense that we never fought, felt it was the right thing to control what was happening with this background chaos of Moore's Law, that with this moral progress, that maybe we can't allow the same chaos, that there would be certain instances, you know, whatever the moral analogy to companies mm -hmm. going bankrupt, maybe we can't allow some of that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and so it, it, these will be interesting governmental or big, uh, you know, entity decisions mm -hmm. uh, of, of uh, you know, what would be the, the, the consequence of allowing anything that can happen to happen? What, what, what things should See, we put limits on? That, to me, already rules the machine out beyond the human. Yeah. I think a human can't live without chaos. I mean, yeah. I think that's what makes us what we are. We, we make, we take chaos, we see things that, you know, all over the map, we put this together and that together and we right. manipulate our world and we construct a world out of this chaos. Right. I don't think that you can give the human this kind of, you know, razor sharp edge logic and expect this individual to survive. I, I think the human is built on chaos. I think the creativity of being human uh, uh, assumes chaos and that out of that chaos we construct who we are. I, yes. I just think if you program a machine that, you know, that chops everything up into the future into blocks of rational behavior, yeah. it's, it's, I wouldn't uh, even know how to deal with that. It's <laughs> very interesting. If, if you look at the program I sent you all for the summit that I'm going to San Francisco Singularity Summit. The first two presentations are just about rationality, nothing more, mm -hmm. and about rationality of young people, um, training young, pe young people to be rational and, and uh, the positive consequence of that. Mm -hmm. And it, it certainly has, you know, analogy with what we should try to do with, with uh, Computers, I mean, if we're going to build in ethics, mm -hmm. it probably has to be rational. Because if it's not rational, how, how will the computers make yeah. sense of it? Except that I don't think that ethical thinking is necessarily rational. No, I, I, I don't I either. And I think the counter argument, I think some people will, you know, get up er get up late on Saturday and not go to those first two <laughs> lectures, they believe this, this is of zero value to them. Yeah. The good stuff lies elsewhere, but maybe the future of mankind depends upon young people being rational. And, and with that thought, why don't some of you come up here and ask, yeah. ask some questions? Come on. What's the worst that can happen? Yes. So uh, while you're talking there um, about ethics and that sort of thing, my, a thought kind of came to me is, say in the future, you know, machines are individuals almost, and they have personalities and they can reason and eth have ethics. Um, how would you see them kind of incorporating themselves into our society, and almost in a sense, like, do you think they'd ever be able to vote 
or even run for office in that sense. Well, uh, uh, assuming there's a lot of assumptions built into that, right? But assuming that that we can build in this kind of uh, ethical thinking, that we can build in uh, um, the kind of thinking that we are known and that we can make machines uh, culturally sensitive, right? So that they make an ethical decision within one kind of culture that they wouldn't make in another. As, uh, assuming that kind of situation, um, the issue then will be in what sense are they superior? Um, I don't think humans will tolerate a absolutely superior being. That is a, a being that will control their lives and tell them what to do. I, I think that humans will draw the line. Um, this is my, my perception, that humans will draw the line at what they will tolerate in, in machines. And what my problem with that statement is, who is going to define that control? And right now, we invest that control in governments and in law and, and in uh, mechanisms of control within society. Um, are we going to allow governments to control that? And I think we've already kind of implied that in the way we are now starting to control the, the internet. Um, and the way that governments are now moving in to shut down the internet if they don't like what's going on. So in effect, we don't hear widespread, you know, offense at this except from, you know, a certain uh, segment of the society. My take on that is this, this is a shadow of, of the future with a machine that is beyond our capability to control. So I think, for whatever it's worth, that we will expect government to uh, control what the machines are capable of doing and what we will allow them to do. And you, when you started, you said that this is a notion and in yeah. one hour, I just have a limited uh, uh, section that I can cover. But there's one aspect of ethics that we didn't talk about, uh, which, which has to do with choice. So yes. you mentioned, for example, the, the scalpel. And mm -hmm. you said, well, there are people on this, on this planet that haven't seen or don't even know what the scalpel is. So there's mm -hmm. an imbalance. Yeah. Um, but some people may not want to know about the scalpel. So the same thing can happen with technology. Yes. They don't want to deal with robots. Mm -hmm. And that's a choice. And they have the right to do so. And 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 that can become a dilemma in all the day. The, the other issue that is interesting is uh, also related to ethics is whether the machine in all the day belongs to some human, somebody, yes. or it's an entity that is independent yes, and responsible. Right. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the laws apply, apply to it mm -hmm. the same way or different laws apply to it. Mm -hmm. Do we just press a button, reset, or put it in prison or whatever? I mean. Mm -hmm. How does it apply? How, how do these laws apply? Or should we consider them a different class of citizens? Or uh, These are interesting questions. Anyway. Yes, so they are great them. questions, actually. And um, uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, very interesting ones. Because um, up to now, we have been comfortable in accepting um, that scientists will uh, always do the right thing. Uh, that we will not have Einstein's blowing up the whole world. We, you know, we we really believe in the moral efficacy of, of scientific reasoning. Um, one of the things that concerns me is the fact that that doesn't seem to apply in the area of uh, robotic development. In other words, um, the issue of developing a robot that is beyond the bounds of what of what we would call scientific control is now within reach and and I think that poses major problems and I don't have enough confidence in scientific uh, 
ethical thinking to believe that they are always going to control that. Moreover, I think it's quite possible, as you yourself point out, we could have companies and other kinds of people who make these machines just for their own uh, purposes. Um, so in effect then, I think there's all kinds of red flags going up. And I don't think we have the ground rules laid down for how this is going to work out. But what I do say is this, that when we make these kinds of machines, the only way that we will be able to relate to them is through a moral and, and ethical environment. We cannot, we cannot make them to uh, operate in an environment with which we cannot con uh, control or with which we cannot relate. So if they are going to operate in our world, they will have to have sensitivity to human dimensions. That's uh, my take on it, yeah. One of the fascinating things that happened when I went to the Singularity University reunion this year, uh, just a few weeks ago now, is that they decided that they should be the first educational entity to have an AI uh, chair of one of their tracks that, I mean, they, they teach multiple tracks mm -hmm. and they thought that uh, they need to be able to claim, at least in 2013, that the chair of one of those uh, educa educational tracks is an uh, AI. What that would mean exactly, they didn't uh, <laughs> Define. They they just want to be able to say it. Then I then I was noticing that there's a Japanese a humanoid robot that they're talking about the end point of that robot. How will you know when they've been successful? It should be able to enter a Japanese uh, university, take courses with other human students, take exams, and you know graduate from whatever course it's in. Mm -hmm. And if it can do that, if it can be successful like that over a four-year period, then they will have really succeeded in what they're setting out to do. So when you think about how provisional your talk is, how much it's based on things that might or might not happen, mm -hmm. It seems like it's, it, it's, it's not based on something that might not happen. The, the, the likelihood of these things happening, because people are pushing for them so much, is very high. Then when you go back to Bill Joy and the idea of relinquishment, mm -hmm. all of you in this room think of whether you would like to be the person responsible for this idea of relinquishment. Let's take things that society could do, society advances, and say, no, we're not going to do that. Let's stop right here. It's not a very popular stance, I think. It's not a thing most people would want to do. Mm -hmm. And the possibility of yours being successful is almost zero. Because there'll be a Captain Nemo on an isolated island somewhere who'll do the thing anyway, even if you stop technology in its tracks in the U.S. and Canada and Europe in some areas. Somebody will do it somewhere on the planet. So I think although uh, relinquishment is, is an interesting idea, it, it's fascinating that you can't name anybody famous who said, okay, I'm going to be the person responsible for relinquishment of this particular area. That person, that identification does not exist. And if any of you sitting in this room think, <laughs> you're probably thinking, yeah, I don't want to do that either. It's not for me. So it's probably not going to happen. It's simply not going to happen, right? Well, I have one comment about that, and then we have to go. And yeah. that is, if we can make a robot to be a chair, I was a chair for most of my career around here. If we can make a robot do what I had to go through, yeah. then let's bloody well make it. Okay? <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> okay.